Hello everybody, welcome back to Science and Nature Untapped and On Tap. So this event is in person at Schnitzel's Pub in Cornwall, Ontario, but is also being viewed virtually on Facebook Live. So welcome everybody. Um, I'll just do a little housekeeping for those that are watching online. If you have any comments, to just put them in the chat section and at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll make sure that your questions and comments are answered. So hello everybody in the room. I don't know if this like, there we go. So before we begin, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee. We offer our gratitude to the Mohawks of Akwesasne for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. In honoring those teachings, we are committed to the process of dismantling, dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism through good relations with each other and the lands we live and work on. The River Institute was founded in 1994 in partnership with the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne. We are committed to listening and to working with our Haudenosaunee partners through all that we do. We are grateful for the time and knowledge that our neighbors graciously give to us and we strive to improve the health of the Great River and surrounding lands. This relationship extends into our personal lives as we get to know each other and build relationships outside our time at work and through mutual interest in the environment. Uh, if ever, especially for those watching online, if you're not in Cornwall, Ontario, and you're curious whose land you're living on, you're working, or you're visiting, I highly suggest checking out the website native-land.ca. Otherwise, you can also send a text and the city of uh, the a text to this number 1907-312-5085 with your city or province, and you'll get a text back telling you whose land you're on. Uh, in case you want to just keep up to date with what the River Institute is working on, future events, our educational programs, you can follow us on social media. Also, if ever you wanted to rewatch any Science and Nature Untapped presentation, you can go to riverinstitute.com slash untapped. So all these presentations are recorded and will be available online for, for future viewing. Uh, we just finished the River Symposium we had last week. It was incredibly uh, successful. We had a virtual day and an in-person day. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, just a shout out to our team and to everybody who joined in. If ever you wanted to watch the talks or re-watch the talks, you can go to riversymposium.riverinstitute.ca slash 2022. So a lot of these events, such as the Science and Nature Untapped, are programs uh, research are generously um, supported by donors. If ever you wanted to make a donation to the River Institute, you can do so at riverinstitute.ca slash donate. So there's a little bit of a typo on my presentation, so it's .ca rather than .com. And so for tonight, we'll be hearing in the forest, the fields, and by the waters, creating a Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe ethnobotanical atlas and field guide to Southern Ontario. Our speaker, Dr. Jessica Dolan, has a bachelor's in history and social sciences from the New School for Social Research, a master's in ethnobotany from University of Kent at Canterbury, and a PhD in environmental anthropology and indigenous studies from McGill University. She is currently a MITAX postdoctoral fellow at Plenty Canada and the University of Guelph Department of Geography, Environment, and Geomatics. She has also worked as an environmental science officer for the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne and Environmental Program and a consultant for St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environment D Division. So Jessica has come here all the way from Vermont. I want you to all give her a warm <laughs> welcome. So thank you, Jessica. I'm going to your slides up. Will you tell me when I have five minutes left? Okay, yes, okay. I can do that. Um, there you go, it's all yours. <coughs> I think I need to hold it and move around a bit. Oh, does it stay attached? Okay, hi everybody. Good evening. Um, 
It's such a joy to be here with everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. It feels like it's been quite a long journey to get here, not just from Southern Vermont, but over the past uh, couple decades. And it's really a joy to continue to work in relationship with each other and see how our lives work, life work, lives work unfold together. Um, tonight, I'm going to be presenting my postdoctoral work. And um, it's been a labor of love, and it still is going to be for another year. And so I welcome any um, feedback, questions, thoughts, reflections on it, because it will help to inform the process. So here we have Garhagu Gahundawanu Danu Aksakta in the forest, the fields, and by the waters, an indigenous biocultural atlas and ethnobotanical field guide project. So tonight, I'm going to share my current research, which combines archival research with ethnographic and environmental fieldwork to create this indigenous digital atlas and field guide to Southern Ontario. The project is a collective formed by Plenty Canada, which is an organization that a bunch of people here may have heard of, and researchers from the University of Guelph. My involvement in building this project, is that, there we go, nope, yeah, there we go, stems from relationships I've developed with Haudenosaunee and Anishin Anishinaabe knowledge holders. Ha ha, yes, okay, good evening. Come in, friends. <laughs> um, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe knowledge holders, teachers and environmental professionals over the last 12 years since carrying out my doctoral research at Six Nations of the Grand River in 2011. Mm -hmm. I'm going to switch. Six Nations, as you might know, including Mississauga, so the New Credit, as well as the general region of Toronto, Hamilton, Niagara Peninsula, Brantford, and West to Oneida and Chippewa, so the Thames, is one of the most populous indigenous regions of Canada, rich with indigenous pluralism. Here you can see treaty maps of Ontario, of Southern Ontario, of the Niagara Escarpment and the Greenbelt region around the greater Toronto area. By way of background, I'll give a little background about my doctoral research, which provides a foundation for my current research. And indeed, I'm still even using some of my field notes from my doctoral research. Um, I carried it out in 2011, and I explored environmental knowledge and philosophies of the Haudenosaunee. I interviewed 45 people about their relationships with and cultural philosophies toward Mother Earth. Most of the interviews took place at Six Nations, but I also traveled with my mentor, Rick Hill, and with a group of mostly moms and kids to learn and place the oral history of the peacemaker and the great law of peace. Through this journeying, I visited communities throughout Haudenosaunee homeland, and I interviewed people from all the nations in these places. Later on, I worked for Onondaga Nation and Center for Native Peoples and the Environment at SUNY ESF. Throughout these experiences, I joined a network of indigenous environmental practitioners who are integrating native science and biocultural traditional knowledge with Western science to restore the elements of their culture and of their homelands that have been destroyed over the last centuries of capitalist settler colonialism. The processes of my doctoral work and many contracts after served as a foundation through which people began to know me as an ethnobotanist and an allied scholar and to talk with me about plants and restoring plant knowledge. Our current project, which my mentors are calling Wisdom from Knowledge, joins into several ongoing restorative movements in Native communities across Turtle Island. One is that of digital mapping or indigenous mapping to make indigenous relationships with landscapes visible and accessible to insiders and outsiders of Native communities. Biocultural mapping has been a movement around the world. Plenty Canada has created a series of projects that they are calling Landscape of Nations 360, which, which are what they call legacy projects in the, southern, in the southern Ontario region, whereby they build monuments, <clears throat> create place-based learning, spaces and trails. They've 
they've commissioned uh, Raymond Skye to do beautiful statues there of historical figures, and they're making exhibits to repopulate the landscape with indigenous storytelling. My mentor, Tim Johnson, who's in the upper photograph with his family and me taking the selfie, who is from Six Nations, um, he used to direct Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., and he heads up these beautiful projects that intertwine history, treaty education, the arts, music, theater, and biocultural conservation, all of which are featured in an annual festival called the Celebration of Nations. My other mentor on this project, Larry McDermott, who's featured in this bottom picture with my daughter up at his um, homestead in Plenty, Canada, um, many of you probably know him. He's developed land-based learning and healing programs for youth and adults across cultures in the areas of food sovereignty, forestry, indigenous protected and conserved areas, and bridging TEK and science. Larry and Tim asked me to join their work to map the Niagara Escarpment and to build relationships and legacy spaces throughout the Niagara biosphere in Ontario. This kind of work contributes to establishing viability, visibility, and depth of indigenous stewardship, advocacy for indigenous treaty rights in their homelands, regeneration of community-based education, and the development of indigenous co-management and protected areas. Their intertwined projects extend geographically from here in eastern Ontario to the Niagara Peninsula and up the Bruce Peninsula to Tobermory. It's pretty awesome. And as the greater Toronto area is one of the fastest growing, most diverse and populous places in North America. Um, <clears throat> and also I, I might add for context here, being on the St. Lawrence upstream from us on the river. <laughs> it's a beautiful challenge to make these multicultural geographies and ecologies legible. So. Since I finished that PhD, I've been working with Haudenosaunee colleagues to discern how to frame an ethnic botanical field guide project. This project is in response to another movement across Native communities, and now I wish I had more pictures to show that movement, because it's really beautiful visually and experientially. And that movement is the one of regenerating environmental knowledge in support of indigenous food systems to reconnect younger generations with their ancestral knowledge of food and medicine plants and restore cultural continuance to that that has been under siege through over a century of residential schooling and assimilative termination policies. Mentors and colleagues such as Peggy Pike Thompson and Henry Lickers and Neil Patterson and many more people, Alicia Cook, have advised me on how to collaboratively research and write a user-friendly book that people can take into field, the field with them as a tool for learning plants. The design and selection of which material we want to include in the guide and the atlas constitute the bulk of the processes of this project. But to summarize, I will say, we've decided we are going to feature common plants used for food, medicine, utility, and craft. And we're going to expose, avoid exposing ceremonial information or promoting this knowledge as a kind of witchcraft. So here's a little bit about FWW. How are we doing all of this? We have a couple of streams of work. Part of my role has been to organize a collective of Ganyankahaga and Anishinaabe educators who are knowledgeable about plants and their language and are interested in working on such a project. In preparation for this, in 2019, I went to the Canada Museum of History in Ottawa and I did research in the Frederick Wilkerson Waugh collection. And here he is pictured up here. I researched his field notebooks, which span the years of 1911 to 1924. In conversation with Haudenosaunee knowledge keepers and community educators, I learned this information he collected from these communities is ancestral knowledge of their descendants today. Some of the people Wa interviewed at that time were elderly, and so that knowledge easily goes back to 1850 or earlier. Even though these documents were in a public museum due to all kinds of different segregation policies and other social barriers, they were not easily accessible to the descendants of Wa's native cultural teachers. Let's see here. So here he is, Wa. 
I'm pretty fascinated by him at this point. He was born in 1872 in Langford, Ontario, near to Six Nations. Wa was hired to work for the federal government by anthropologist Edward Sapir, head of the Anthropology Division of the Geological Survey of Canada. Between 1911 and 1924, he worked as a preparator for the ethnology section, then assistant ethnologist, and then associate ethnologist. His collection at the museum is a rich source of learning for indigenous traditional knowledge. One of the reasons why is he learned from men and women and he credited them, credited them all by name. He also followed, or I would say respected, the Haudenosaunee practice of adoption and inclusion by interviewing an African-Canadian man who had grown up at Six Nations and was fluent in Cayuga and cultural knowledge. The knowledge contained in many of his notes feels very alive, just as many traditional knowledge holders speak of knowledge as having a life of its own, of being living and being collectively held. Some of his notes, however, appear to describe some things that may not be true <laughs> and may have been interviewees poking fun at colonial ethnology. <laughs> So, this is yet another reason to work with cultural insiders or knowledge holders to discern what from Waz or other people's collections um, is true, relevant, useful for folks today, and even persistent knowledge and practices, as some notes radically, are radically different and may have been folks telling him tall tales. The vast quantity of his extensive and very detailed collection is rich, though, and can support cultural regeneration intergenerationally, as he endeavored to study the Haudenosaunee languages as well, and he had a great knowledge of botany. Wa disappeared mysteriously in 1924 while crossing the Mercier Bridge from Ganawage to Montreal, and I feel very sad and curious about what actually happened to him. So if anyone knows any resources about what happened to Wa and his family, please let me know. And yet when I recently learned from an article um, by Sebastian Cacard at Concordia University that I took the same field routes as Wa did last summer, around 100 years after he did his research. I became even more fascinated by this history <laughs> because I was retracing similar pathways of learning that he did 110 years ago. So here are some examples of his field notebooks and some of my field notebooks and how I am organizing information into Excel charts. Over the course of the days that I was in Ottawa, I um, selected about 800 pages for di digitization and the curators were super patient with me and very just lovely. And, um, and all of these uh, notebook pages that I selected contain information about traditional foods, medicines, craft, and utility. And then I rematriated those digital copies to about 40 people across Akwesasne, Onondaga, Six Nations, Gaknawage, who are scholars, plant people, environmental workers, educators, and more. This whole year, I've been working to synthesize this knowledge from his note notebooks, as well as other published information, my own field notes, and contributions from mentors and peers, all into an Excel chart of metadata. And you can see like a little corner of it up there. I'm organizing the chart by plant name in English on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, I've inputted Latin, Ganyangeha, which is Mohawk language, French, um, Anishinaabemowin. I'm doing a separate chart for Anishinaabeg knowledge. So on, in this chart, it's Latin, Ganyangeha, French, and then habitat type, conservation status, and plant uses by source. I'm organizing the sources so that I can give credit where credit is due. And I'm using my own knowledge and experience and working with the Indigenous Advisory Committee I've assembled to select plant species and uses that are relevant and appropriate. So we have documented over 200 species so far for both Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe. The goal is to incorporate sources that are 100 years or older um, with contemporary knowledge and create a thoughtful in inquiry into continuity and change. For some youth who are learning their ancestral knowledge of the environment, this could be a profound source of pride, identity, and healing to be reconnected with this ancestral place-based knowledge of plants. And I'm working with this team here, and there's 
some people who are going to join. Oh man, my slide got messed up, it looks like. Sorry about that. Um, there's a couple more people who are going to join, but you'll see at the upper right there's Deha Hande Miller, and next to me is Alyssa General, and below are the students from Guelph. This is going clockwise. And then right there is Brian Peltier from Wikwemekong First Nation. Um, and a couple more people from Aqua Sosne are going to join now, actually. So we're working um, to select the species that will be um, relevant, useful, and appropriate. Hang on for a minute here. Do, 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 do. All right. Okay, I think that we're going to feature between 75 and 100 species in the book because over 200 would be too long for a book. <laughs> so we're working together to select them. Can I ask you a question before you get too far oh. in that? This, no? Okay. I, I don't have much longer, so there should be plenty of time to have a really good conversation. Yeah. Um, so, uh, where was I? Yes, okay, the knowledge holders are working on the linguistic, the linguistics and the or orthography of the indigenous languages. And then also, um, I'm writing up each plant species, like a pr plant profile, and then I'm going to uh, vet it through the committee, and they're going to decide which knowledge they want to include and which they don't. And then they're each going to write culturally grounded introductory sections. So the introduction will be in Ganyankeha, Anishinaabemowin, and English. And since the area that we're studying is a place where Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe homelands overlap, and many families are related, it's appropriate that we want to feature both of these cultural knowledge systems integrated with Western science. Okay, so that's a lot about the ethnographic part. Now here, we're gonna get into the science part a little bit more. The plant biology component of this project has been carried out by University of Guelph graduate student, Mia Yu Zhao Ni. Mia chose these sites that are featured in red on the map. She made this map as well. Um, based upon documented historical indigenous trails and portage places. She and two research assistants did extensive field research this year. Throughout the spring and summer, they studied species diversity, richness, and health in 23 sites. But at each of these 23 sites in red, they had three subplots. So they did 69 site visits in the spring and then they went back and they did it in the summer. And um, all of these sites are along public trails on the Niagara Peninsula to the Bruce Peninsula to the Oak Ridges Moraine. Hang on for a minute, I gotta get some water. Da -da -da -da. And recently, Ganyankahaga mapping and data, data sovereignty doctoral student Marina Johnson Zafiris and Cree graphic designer David Beyer has joined our team. And they're going to advise us on indigenous data sovereignty, mapping, and design our interactive website and field guide. And here's a photo from one of our recent Zoom meetings. The students. Um, visited the 23 sites first in the spring to capture photography and spring inventories. And then I joined them during their second round. And many summer plants were blooming and trees were beginning to fruit. Altogether, they collected over 2,000 voucher specimens, which are going to be housed at the University of Guelph Herbarium, which is a tremendous amount of work. And this, these data serve as botanical ground truthing, which demonstrate through finding plants and trees in public places where native people have treaty rights to gather for personal use, that the species described in historical documentation by the ancestors of today's communities are also still here. 
some of the species are shifting north or are returning due to climate change. And such as we found a bunch of young pawpaw trees in Coots Paradise in the Royal Botanical Garden of Hamilton. In that picture where they look very happy and Mia's wearing her mosquito netting as they're, they're sitting next to one of the pawpaw trees. We were really excited about it. Um, so here are some of the plants we're documenting or that we documented along the trails in southern Ontario. You can see black cherry. Um, there's witch hazel up there on the top left. Um, now I'm going counterclockwise. We've got bone set, St. John's wort. Um, there's Virginia creeper everywhere, and that's motherwort and a giant spider, daddy long legs. And here you have, of course, cedar and wild ginger. And I believe that um, Mia's holding, I think that's a slippery elm, but it might be a crotagus. It's kind of hard to see. Crotagus is hawthorn. Um, here you have a Sagittaria down here and a paper birch, and there's the beautiful landscape of Tobermory. So at this point, we're finishing up processing all of these data, and we're beginning to write plant profiles, one species at a time, for the Digital Atlas and Field Guide. And I'm going to now give you an example of how we're going to do the pro plant profiles. Of course, it's not going to look exactly like this in the book, but because it's a PowerPoint, but here's an example. So here you have pepper root, cardamom diphylla. It's also known as crinkle root, toothwort, two-leaf toothwort, and etc. cetera. Cardamom is a Greek word. I think it's actually like cardamom in Greek, and it means cress, and diphylla refers to two leaves. But it's, for those who haven't studied botany, so if you, if you look up here, you can see there's clusters of three. So one cluster of three is one leaf. And then on the other side, you have the other leaf, which is an, also a cluster of three. Um, <clears throat> this native plant grows on the eastern half of the continent in uh, partial shade and rich alluvial forests in moist soil and on slopes, but it doesn't like to grow under fir trees. Pepper root refers prefers growing in leaf litter from deciduous trees, and it's dormant during the summer, and then active in the fall and winter. And for that reason, a good time to collect. Its leaves and roots are in the fall. Both leaves and roots are edible, raw, and cooked. Pepper root is similar looking to its lovely cousin, cardamom concatenata, featured on the bottom left there, the cut leaf toothwort, and the toothy margins Toothy margin leaves of the pepper root appear palmate in clusters of three to five on two stems, while the cut leaf, tooth, cut leaf toothwort leaves are more slender and deeply lobed in appearance and are also arranged around the stem in a whorl. These toothworts are host to butterflies who lay their eggs on them, and their foliage and pollen are food for native species of beetles and bees. Pepper root was one of the first edible Haudenosaunee plants I learned about when I went to Six Nations. It was actually in 2009. And I learned about it from the late Onondaga Beaver Clan chief, Arnold General. He told me it was his favorite snack and handed me a root to try and then proceeded to have a huge good laugh when he saw my face react. Pepper root is spicy and has a radish-like flavor and some people think it tastes like horseradish. Arnie would go out to collect the roots himself, and he kept them in the refrigerator along with other vegetables. He ate them on sandwich bread. When he became elderly and couldn't co go collect them himself, any longer other people brought him pepper root. It was his favorite. The name of the root, toothwort, refers to tooth-like protrusions of the root where it meets the stem. The roots are thought of as blood cleaners, and that's what Arnie told me. They're good for colds, poultice for headaches, and made into tea, oh, the leaves are made into tea for hoarseness and colds as well. Over 110 years ago, F.W. Waugh's collections at Six Nations, oh, F.W. Waugh's collaborators at Six Nations described this root as being eaten with salt, added to meat soups, used as a famine food, and he documented this in one of his notebooks from 1912. How much more time do we have? Okay, so I have, I have one more. Oh, 
that includes questions or no? Okay. Okay, I have one more to show you. It's a little bit less developed here, but it's pretty interesting. Um, these are wild onions. They're collected in the spring by people all across Native communities wherever they grow. And it took me a while to figure out which species they are because I think there are at least three species, actually. There's Allium canadense, which is the wild meadow garlic slash onion. And that one is um, called Garhaguma on onunskili in, in, uh, in Mohawk. Um, and there's Allium cernuum, wild onions, also called that in Mohawk. And then there's Allium vineal, wild garlic, also called that in Mohawk. And there, I have a couple of other um, names here for it too. And um, I first learned about these from Hickory Edwards at Onondaga Nation. He, this is one of his favorite plants because it grows along the rivers um, and the creeks, and he's, he's an avid paddler. He took me and a couple people paddling down Onondaga Creek, creek there. You can see how silty it is. Um, and that's me after I fell in. I capsized the kayak. But the onions grow, they like to grow in sandy soil along the edges of rivers and creeks. And they will grow in the forest understory. Um, it depends on the soil type. The thing is, is that there's also, I have to look into it more, but wild garlic seems to grow more in meadows rather than along, um, along riverbanks. And I think that it has to do, um, I think that it's a different species. So I still have to look into it a bit more. But what's fascinating to me is that all of these plants have the same name in Ganyangeha. And they're all used as spring blood cleaners. So you collect them in very early spring. They're some of the first plants, new plants, that come up along with the spring ephemerals and all the blood cleaners in the spring. And then you can make a really nice soup with them. And Hickory taught me how to clean them. You can see here on the left, they have like a little netting over their, their root bulb. So you have to take the netting off. And that's my daughter trying to help me to do it. And then once they're clean, they look very lovely there. And then you can cut them up and make them into a nice, you know, clear or white broth soup with potatoes, maybe some spinach or corn. I put bacon in one once because bacon was good in everything. And um, it's, it's just a, it's a hearty soup, but it has a fresh green. And these onions are famine foods because they're plant, where they grow, they're plentiful. Um, I found out about the three species in the Foxfire series, which is a series on uh, crafting and folklore <coughs> in Appalachia. So they're also an Appalachian food. Um, yeah, so that's another one that will be featured. So I want to say in conclusion, and we'll ha let's have a good conversation after this. Um, in keeping with indigenous methodologies, the processes of this project are as important as the outcomes. The processes are part of the outcomes. The knowledge regeneration that we're sharing, the people who join in and take an interest in this, the slow and steady pace of it, it's all part of the outcome and relationship building. These relationships that we carry forward through working with each other to generate educational materials are part of the regeneration of intergenerational ethnobotanical knowledge. The cross-cultural elements of our project are in line with renewing peace building and knowledge sharing between peoples in ethical spaces. As well, an important part of renewing relationships with plants is knowing where to find them. We want to create materials so that people can take a user-friendly book out onto the land and learn on the land and learn how to find plants. Once you start to be able to identify plants on the landscape and you can recognize them and even name them and greet them by name, then the landscape, it's like it goes from a blur of green into sharp relief of all of these friends and characters. And you feel even more grounded and at home. And very importantly, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, people who I've talked to say that a very important part of 
transmitting indigenous ethnobotany is so that people will know the plant names in their languages and be able to relearn that again. Because some people feel that the plants will listen to them better, recognize them more, and that the medicine works better, the medicine and the nutrition, if you can speak to them in Ganyanke. Ganyankeha and the Nishinabemowin. Let's see, here's my last page. So the ling linguistic components of this project are intended to help restore that ability in Native communities. I think I want to stop there, but thank you so much for listening about my project, and I would love to have a really wonderful discussion about the snow. Um, there, I, I should read this off. I just want to say thank you so much to the St. Lawrence River Institute for inviting me to share my research and for creating this beautiful public speaker series. And then also to the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environment Division for trusting and hiring me as an ethnobotanist. To MCA Environment Program for also trusting to hire me as an ESO. And to friends, mentors, and colleagues who have supported me on this project for six years. Especially Peggy Pike Thompson, Henry Lickers, Abraham Francis, Jessica Jock, Rick Hill, Brenda Hill, Taya Hux, Yunat Weahawe Sargent, Wissendi Osta George, Neil Patterson Jr., Terry Lynn Brandt, Alicia Cook. Um, and these are my advisors who I've mentioned, or in collaborator, advisors and collaborators who I've mentioned in the project. And also, I want to acknowledge that this Plenty Canada project is funded by the Greenbelt Foundation as well as my text and University of Guelph. So thank you so much, everybody, and let's have a good conversation about it. OK, we'll open up the floor to questions. And is my, uh, yeah. First. So to everybody who's watching online as well, if you have any questions or comments, to just put it in this, the comment section. I have the Magai who will ask those questions for you, uh, and everybody in the room. I already see a hand up with Elaine. Oh, but, so. oh and Elaine, do you mind if you go second after this gentleman oh, yeah. here who had a... I, I was excited that you <laughs> had like a burning contribution to make. <laughs> so, <laughs> you spoke about uh, Mr. Waugh and his family that yeah. crossed uh, from uh, Kahnawaga. Yeah. Uh, on the bridge to to Montreal, and mm -hmm. that was the end of it. Where was he going? What happened? <laughs> 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 That's my question too. I think it's one of it's a great mystery. So the the story ends there. Like he nobody knows he. He disappeared off the bridge. Maybe he fell off. He might have fallen off. I think it was the winter time. Yeah. Okay. And All he right. might have been walking. You know. Because okay, he he was um, how would I say he he was something like you and he's looking in he was looking into different plants and stuff like that. Okay, it's easy to be a little a, bit superstitious about it, yeah. um, and kind of so th there's something I didn't include in this, which is that there's a previous scholar, an Iroquoianist. Should I talk into this? Do you want me to talk into that? Um, there's a previous scholar who's an Iroquois, Iroquois named James Herrick. And he published a book called Iroquois Medical Botany. Um, and this book, um, it's really big. It's based on his dissertation. It's really good. Um, but a lot of it is based on the WA collections. And you don't even realize it until you go and look at the WA collections. That WA was... Um, Wa published a book called, uh, I think it's called Iroquois Foods and Food Preparation in, in um, the early 20th century, and that's all he published. And he was on his way, I think, to publishing a book about medicines. Because if you ever go up to that collection, there's, um, and of course, at Murphy's Law, I went through all his field notebooks, and then the, uh, the um, curator <laughs> pointed out, that there's a card catalog <laughs> in which he had synthesized his field notes into <laughs> alphabetized. And so he was on his way, I believe, to publishing something like this. And so later on, James Herrick, he published something like this. 
But in Herrick's, earlier on in anthropology and, and in academia in general, it's like, uh, especially we talk about it in ethnobotany and ethnobiology, scholars felt they had to scientificize things. So the way that Herrick did it, he kind of took the people out of it a bit. And he, it was all about the knowledge and the plants. But he didn't have the people's names in with the plants. He had the people's names in the end in an index. So you can still see it there. But he didn't have the stories. It, it, it wasn't as uh, visceral as it could have been. But I don't, I don't blame him for it because I think that was the standard of the academy at the time is that make it as scientific as possible. Um, and probably the publishers had something to do with it as well. Um, so some people who are in the know about this could say, why are you doing this again? Like he already did something like this. But we really want to make this more user friendly. We want it to be with beautiful pictures. We want it to have stories. We want people's names with the plants in relationship with the plants. People talk about plant relatives, plant kin. Those things help to make these things alive, um, even in the text. And even though we realize it's just a text, it needs living people to animate it as well. Right? Like it's not, it can't be everything. It has to, there's no replacement for oral transmission of learning. Um, so that's a, a long thing to say. Like Wa, he was, he was really fantastic and he was on his way to doing more and his collections are really amazing and it's um, hard to believe that people don't know what happened. Yeah. Is yeah. some of this, uh, you know, finding all these, uh, these bushes and roots and whatnot, uh, ancestral stuff, is, is some of this being taught in indigenous schools or is this yeah. something that's just going to disappear like Mr. Wa did? It's not going to disappear. It's, it's already being, the, the way that I came into this is also by listening to indigenous teachers think about and take action to bring it back. Um, and so like, for example, the field notes that I have in there are when I was volunteering as a counselor at a youth camp on Thompson Island. And uh, one of the medicine people from the community, Eddie Gray, was there teaching the teenagers. Um, and there's, you know, there's people who are um, carefully making sure that they make uh, public teachings about every aspect of plants and traditional knowledge available to their community members and kin all the time. It's not going to go away. So kids in school now, are they taking this in or are they kind of not interested in it? I don't know. We'll no. have to see. Like each, each person has their own interest. Um, I don't teach in high school, so I don't know. <laughs> but I can't do like a characterization of that. But if, you know, it's like field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. Like we want to make these sort of things available for people who would take an interest. Yeah, okay, ready. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for all this information. I think it's, it sounds great, and I'm, I congratulate you on the work that you've done. Okay. Are you deciding upon the plants that you're going to include according to their cons conservation status? Because, yeah. and, and in that, are you going to include any information about how to collect so that you can protect whatever part of the plant you don't need? Um, I mean, uh, Okay, if you if you have to collect the root, well, then that's the end of that particular plant. But yeah. yeah, sometimes there's ways of even collecting part of the root and leaving part behind, etc. So, are you going to include those kind of things so that the so that um, people that do want to use this as a as a handbook are, are still protecting the future of those plants? Yeah, that's a actually excellent. I should have included that in this talk, and it's really good feedback for me to incorporate into the talk as I move forward. Um, and so in the introduction of the book, which I didn't really um, elaborate on very much, we each, uh, we're each writing about what we did, like our methods, but also an orientation. And in my doctoral work, I learned a lot about harvesting values and environmental values because it, it was about Haudenosaunee relationships with, with Mother Earth. 
I have a lot of, um, I have these synthesized environmental values that I've sort of like summarized as, as, as uh, guideposts. Um, and then also there's the Indigenous Advisory Committee and they are also writing about their, from their perspective. So it's really different writing from the first person and the third person <laughs> and we want to have it all, right? Um, so they're going to be writing about values as well. We had a discussion about, should we include any plants that are at all threatened? Um, and even for that in the field guide as well as the map. Like we didn't, we don't want to have points on the map that like has, that directs the avid foragers who want to make big bucks in the Toronto restaurant scene <laughs> to all the ramps, you know? <laughs> um, but the fact is, is that most of these plants are extremely common. In fact, I'm, getting more and more enamored with uplifting the most common plants and the ethnobotany of everyday life. I want the most basic plants to become beautiful and magical to people. <laughs> and I, so we don't even really want to include plants that are famous. Um, you know, one of the um, most unsung famous Mohawk medicinal plants is ginseng. I think all settlers learned about ginseng from Mohawks and from Mohawk women, actually, if you read the history of it. Um, that's another paper that I hope to co-write with someone at some point. <laughs> but like, we're not gonna put ginseng in here um, because we already know how rare the wild ginseng is. There's tons of ginseng farms in Southern Ontario too, for that reason. Um, so they're, they're going to be common that's a really good point about specific harvesting instructions for each species. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna have to write that down and really talk it through with the rest of the team because there's some things, this is why we need to get going with writing the plant, individual plant profiles. There's some things that once you start doing it, you're like, oh no, I forgot this big thing. <laughs> And that is one that will definitely, it, it should be very specific. It shouldn't be just about, um, you know, parts used and then, peop and then refer to the introduction for don't take the first one you see, don't take more than 15%, don't, you know, all of that. No, it should be in each species. That's a good point. Thank you. Hi, I have a whole bunch of comments from the online audience, so we'd oh, like to great. bring them in if that's all right. Yeah. Um, okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay, so Bruce Kahn is joining us again, and that's always great. Nice to have you here with us, Bruce. Um, he's joining from Georgia in the USA. Uh, Ganarindo White, um, the comment is, this is not Haudenosaunee traditional territory. It's the Iroquois of the Seven Nations of Canada traditional territory. Oh, okay, so, right, I, hmm. It would be interesting for me to really discuss with people how, how I go about talking about that. Well, the field guide is to Southern Ontario, even though we have people from the Seven Nations working on this, um, and that's where we are right now, it's true. And I, I just really want to promote Darren Bonaparte's work right now. I think that everyone would do well to learn more about the history of the Seven Nations. And he and um, oh, Jean-Francois Jean Lozier, he, sorry, Jean-Francois, if you're watching and I said your last name wrong, but they, they both write really, really good history of the Seven Nations and of this area. Um, and yeah, who was it who said recently, oh, it was Just Jock. I love how she was like, I've heard of the five nations, I've heard of the six, na six nations, what's up with the seven nations? <laughs> and it's just really important to look at how um, people adapted politically and economically and militarily to align in response and strategy to settler colonialism. So the seven nations are um, relatives with the Haudenosaunee, but for sure they're they're not the same thing as the Haudenosaunee. And that's, that point is being made to say that don't just, well, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but it, it's important to not just always use Haudenosaunee as a blanket for everything. Yeah. 
Thank you for commenting. I'm sure they'll appreciate your yeah. your response. Um, there's a there's a uh, someone who would like to know if we could get access to your PowerPoint presentation. Sure. So we can share that. Possibly. I'll, I'll have to run it by um, my team first because there's pictures of them. So I'll make sure they all feel safe. Um, you know, like yeah. good about about it being shared more broadly. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and maybe you can get hold of uh, Stephanie, the person who wrote that in, and then okay. you guys yeah, can connect that. like that. Yeah. Um, Melanie Orlet asked, thanks for the work. When is the book expected to be released? <laughs> oh, right. So um, I was saying earlier, this is one of the amazing things about working with Tim Johnson, because he has this long career at Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, and he's used to getting exhibits and publications, and I think he... Gosh, he's done so much. I mean, he did like a newspaper, he did journals, he did he's done so much and he but he's used to getting things out and generating results. So in contrast with what sometimes happens in academia when we like perseverate over like two thousand plant specimens for five years, or like I need to get all of the WAD data analyzed or whatever, Tim says, we've got to have it by next November is when we have to have our book draft ready to go in to the publisher. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> okay, and John Tandro says, this is a wonderful approach. Thank you for sharing the knowledge. Thanks. And then Peggy Pike-Thompson okay, has a lovely comment. She <laughs> says, LOL, my son was always with me in the field when he was younger. When he went to off-reserve schools, he asked me what was wrong with his teacher because she knew nothing about plants and had no clue what Echinacea purpurea was. So that's a fun comment from Peggy. Peggy, Peggy's thanks for watching. Botanist. Um, <laughs> can I keep going? Are yes. we all right? Um, Christine Landry Matamoros says, if we want to share family stories and knowledge, how can we get involved? Are there plants to get Eastern Ontario, upstate New York, and Western Quebec areas included in a future atlas. Um, okay, so we have, well, my friend Hickory, who does the Haudenosaunee canoe journeys every year, has asked um, myself um, and some other folks if we would like to map the canoe journeys he takes from Seneca Territory all the way to uh, Mohawk Territory in the homelands, which is in New York. Um, and he, he would like to document the plants along the waterways there. So Abraham Francis and Hickory and Hickory Edwards and Neil Patterson and I just met to start to generate a project about a guide to traversing those areas and land and water-based learning down there. So that's maybe coming up next after this. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Yay. Um, if, thanks so much for this talk, and it's it's really exciting to see a postdoc project like producing something other than academic papers. And yeah, this looks really lovely. I was wondering, I, I have a simple question: if you've thought about the visuals and what you're going to use for the visuals in the book at all? Yeah, it's it's weird because um, I've taken a lot of photos and gathered them, and so have the students, and we're still organizing them. But they still might not be enough, right? So, and as we write those plant profiles, we're going to end up being like, oh, we really need this other part of the plant as an identifying characteristic. And then also, the other thing that just happened is I realized I never... <laughs> I never researched Wa's photography collection. So Wa has all these pictures of people doing things with plants at the turn of the 20th century at Six Nations and up in Manitoulin Island. And so I'm like, ah, what do I do? I better go back to the museum. Um, so we, we, um, we are talking about that now. And that's why we're working with David Beyer, the graphic designer, because he has... Um, he has extensive experience, and we all agree that um, aesthetics really matter in efficacy. Um, Stephanie, your work is an example of this. If things are beautiful, they become more compelling, and it helps pull people in to be able to learn better and make it feel like it's more accessible. So we need to try to do that. Mm -hmm. Amazing work. Thank you. Yeah.
Um, I just want to also thank you for your presentation. Uh, how excited you are, like, I think makes it exciting for everyone else, too. Um, it's really interesting. Um, you keep talking about the wall collection. You're so excited about the wall collection. And it's making me curious if that's available for public access. Can we go and yeah. see the collection? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm feeling really bad because they, um, the collections manager, I'm forgetting his name right now, and I should have looked it up, but he's so kind. And you should definitely go check it out. If, cause so not everyone has a brain or a heart who would be interested in this kind of thing. Like sitting in a room, being very careful with archival materials and spending hour after hour reading it. But when I read it, it was like a movie. Like and it might if you're interested, it might be for you too. Like you might be able to imagine the people or even like smell the smells of what it might be like there or. Imagine the light, and anyway, so all you have to do is um, you can look look it up online, and then contact the collections manager and make an appointment, and go up, and he'll let you in. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever have the opportunity to check out the um, collection? of plants at the Montreal Botanical Gardens and the writings of Fray Marie Victoria, who did mm -hmm. a, who collected um, over a million plants in the early 1900s. Ooh. It, it was in, mostly in Quebec, but many of these plants are in this area as well. Is it in the herbaria? At herbarium, it's herbarium, and also, there's also his book okay. that he wrote. It's in French, but, That's okay. but uh, it's, it's a, it's a reference for plants of that area for, 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 uh, in, uh, in that time. Okay. So it might be a good reference for you. What's his name again? Frère Marie Victoria. Okay, Marie Victoria. Okay. Um, I'll write it down. Thank you so much. He's the founder of the Montreal Botanical Garden. Is he really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that would be amazing. Okay. I love the Montreal yeah. Botanical Garden and um, have some contacts there and the organized a couple of conferences there too. It's just so beautiful. So that would be a marvelous reason to go and visit mm. for a long period of time. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions or are we satisfied? Yep, it's on. I have a question. Yeah. Oh, you have questions. Oh, you do? Oh, <laughs> amazing. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, apologies if I missed a portion of it and missed the one phrase that I'm about to ask is you mentioned that you uh, did do some scanning of some of his work. Mm -hmm. uh, is there plans to fully digitize it so that we can access it on an online portal to look into it? Yeah, I think I, I actually haven't checked back to see... Um, how much they've done that, but they might. So the reason, I wish I could remember his name right now, the collections manager was really obliging with all of this. And then it's possible that part of the reason why is that it could then be put up online. So it was a reason, a motivation to get all this done and then be made available more broadly. But I haven't checked back to see. Um, I, Museums and collections are often always in the process of digitization for like years and years. So it's likely. <laughs> um, good question. <laughs> okay, a couple more if we have yep. time from online. Sorry, I, I, um, a few more came in. Um, Hazel May asked, will you be including non-native species? There are lots of non-native plants that it would be great for people to use because they're invasive yeah we're going to um all right so we're not focusing on an invasive oh i i am such a huge fan of the black forager i don't know if everyone's watched alexis nicole on online but um <laughs> what does alexis say eat the colonizers i mean she's like she's so great <laughs> or eat the invasives but there's a big movement right now to eat the invasive and colonizing plants as a way by way of using them um, and also speculating on, on revitalizing uses of emergent plants, like, for example, the, the cattail hybrid that is all around here. Um, but 
So this could really set things off, so I'll try to make it short. Um, it's mostly native plants because we're doing a diachronic analysis. We're trying to get um, things that have remained and are still here and are staying the same or coming back over long periods of time. But also a lot of non-native plants have been here for a long time, like plantain and certain species of nettles and some of the yarrows, although a yarrow just basically has a circumpolar distribution. So like mm, this idea about native and non-native plants and here's where I bring in Henry's naturalized knowledge systems as well. So there's a lot of non-native plants that are part of indigenous pharmacopoeia because they've become naturalized into that pharmacopoeia. So this Western science distinction of native and non-native plants isn't quite the same. I think basically what we're going to do is decide upon species based on cultural salience. And our, our uh, advisory committee, and we're all going to decide together which ones we feel are most important right now. Yeah. Okay, there's quite a few more comments, but if I have just one, one from John Tandro, he says, will you include some of the tricks about plants that I've heard Mohawks like to play on people? <laughs> so that's interesting, but I will not be. And one of the, oh, this could also set off a lot here, hey? Um, one of the things is that... Um, the Iroquois Medical Botany book, if you go and read it, and everyone should, there's a lot about charms, like specifically love charms, and we are not including love charms in our field guide. Uh, and no, no witchcraft charms, no tricks. Is that the tricks that that person's talking about, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, and I'll, I'll round it out with uh, Peggy also says, Marie Victorian did work in Ganawage on medicinal and other plants. So oh, that's okay. back so to that's you. Yeah. Up. yeah, thank yeah. you, Peggy. Yeah. <laughs> Is that it? Thank you, everybody. Miigwech. Cool. I just wanted to give you a little gift from the oh, River man. Institute. Oh, wow. Oh, it's um, so beautiful. There's a little bite on the cover book. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my gosh. That's wonderful. Thank you for taking the time to present and to be here with us. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for listening about my labor of love. For <laughs> <laughs> one of them. <laughs> this is awesome. That's it. I guess just a message for everyone watching online. We'll be back next month. Uh, I believe we will be in person again, but we'll be streaming as we did today. So thank you for joining. Thank you for your comments. And thank you for your questions. Bye. <laughs>